Women's Health, tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. As the nursery rhyme says, sugar and spice and all things nice, that's what little girls are made of. If only it were that easy. The human body in general is a complicated mass of organs, bones and joints and chemicals and fluids and hormones. And a woman's physiology is further complicated by the female biological imperative of reproduction and its associated effects on the female body. Tonight we will explore the particular concerns of women's health during various life stages. And joining us to help answer your questions, because we really do need your questions, is Dr. Ellen Hopper and Dr. Larissa Bennis, both of the Avera Medical Group Brookings Health System, OBGYN doctors both. Thank you both for joining us. So Ellen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you, where are you from? Oh, I grew up in Pierre, South Dakota. You're a Pierre native. I am a Pierre girl, yep. And went to medical school at USD. Undergraduate? And undergraduate I did at a small school in Pennsylvania that most people have not heard of called Juniata College. Okay. Now what got you out there, by the way? Uh, just Pennsylvania sounded cool, I guess, when <laughs> I was 18. It was supposed to be good for women in science. And okay. I thought I wanted to go into science, so there I went. But then you went to med, med school at? Medical school at USD in Vermilion and did my um, second two years in Sioux Falls, our clinical years, and then did my residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas in Wichita, right. so for four years. So, and then from there? And then came to the lovely town of Brookings. There we are. We're great. Good. Yes. And we are so glad to have you. Well, thank you. And Larissa, you are from where originally? I am originally from Millbank. Born and raised there, graduated from high school there. Millbank, a uh, Millbank Devil, or what is the nope, Millbank? Bulldog. Bulldog. Millbank Bulldog. Well, that's a, I thought way. it was a DeSmet Bulldog. <laughs> well, they might have Bulldogs too. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> we have Bulldogs Madison at DeSmet. has Bulldogs. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Bulldogs. <laughs> so, Millbank, and then yep. you came to? Then I did my undergrad at Augustana College in Sioux Falls. And from there on, I followed, followed a very similar path to Dr. Hopper. I did my med school down at USD in Vermilion and did my uh, residency down at uh, Kansas School of Medicine in Wichita as well. So, so what is this Wichita connection? I, I, Dr. Wee yeah. is from the Wichita area mm -hmm. too. And right. there are a lot of Sioux Falls OBGYNs that went to our program mm -hmm. in Wichita too. Oh. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a very good it's residency. A, it's a, yep, you get a lot of hands-on training and um, yeah. We yeah. like that. Mentors mm -hmm. before us from South Dakota. So. All right. Yep. People had good experiences in the past, passed that on to us, and so there you go. Gave it a shot. Off to Wichita. Yes. Yep. We'll answer your questions as they're called in, and we'd like you to hurry because the sooner you get them in, the better chance we'll get to them. Should there be more questions that we have time during the show, we'll continue live streaming on the internet after the show in our after hours portion of our evening. Call us at one. 888-376-6225 or email your questions to ask at oncalltv.org. So we, the whole show is built on your questions. We need them. Please think of it. Give us a call. If you're a guy, I challenge you. Guy questions will be even especially appreciated. But all questions are very much important. So let's talk about the issues that probably uh, uh, run in uh, the most common problems that you see every day in the population of 50 and older. What would that be? Okay, um, so we see a lot of abnormal bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding mm -hmm. that needs to be evaluated um, in that population. Average age of menopause is 51 in our country. Um, so of course it's just an average and, and people fall out from there, but um, if you ever have bleeding after menopause, of course it needs to be evaluated because of the risk of cancer. cancer. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the percentage of people who have postmenopausal bleeding after menopause and then they're bleeding, what percentage of those, what percentage of those are, are something bad, Larissa? Um, it depends a lot on a lot of different factors. There's a lot of things that can kind of play into that. Um, hormonal status, whether they're taking any sort of estrogen supplementation, anything like that. Um, obesity plays a very big factor in things. Uh, people that have an elevated BMI have a higher risk for having, having some sort of abnormal pathology that's be behind the source of that uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. But percentage, what percentage is cancer? 
That's I don't know that I could tell 50%? you. 50%? Oh, less. Oh, less than that. Yeah. yeah. 20%. Mm-hmm. So. Luckily, the majority yes. of the time when we see bleeding after menopause, we don't often find a cancer. Well, I mean, it, it can it, be. it's that balance of things that is happening. Menopause is a right. tough time. Your body's trying right. to figure out things, and sometimes there's bleeding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but sometimes it it's cancer. Has to be, right, mm-hmm. yes, it absolutely has to be ruled out. Yep. That's the main thing that we want to try to make sure we're evaluating patients for, is for the so risk I'm of cancer. Ro- I'm rotating on the OBGYN mm-hmm. uh, service while I'm a med student at Emory in Atlanta. And the, the head guy was teaching that month, which mm-hmm. was a great pleasure to be because he was the big kahuna and he was very good. And I can remember saying, postmenopausal bleeding means D and C. I mean, you got bleeding, you need to evaluate it. Now a DNC was they would dilate the cervix and they would cure it or scrape out the lining mm-hmm. of the uterus. We don't do that anymore, do we? Well, we Not still- as a first line. Yeah, we still do it on occasion, but we have an in-office sampling technique um, that we do much more frequently called an endometrial biopsy. We use a little pipel, it's like a catheter. Um, that you slide in through the cervix. It doesn't kind of, need much dilation to no, do it. No, not at all. It acts like a little vacuum and kind of suctions some of the tissue out. So, In addition to that, we can also um, do a little bit of imaging type of evaluation with usually a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, we usually use the transvaginal method because it, it gives us a lot better visualization of um, specifically the endometrial thickness do you is do what that we're usually in the looking for. Um, we can, usually I would say more often we would kind of have that done um, so that the images can be stored, looked at for later, and we can have a little bit more thorough evaluation. So the things. transducer, which is that probe that they rub over your belly when you've got a baby in there yep. and then you can see the baby, that's a, a ultrasound that's sound waves, right? Mm-hmm. But you said transvaginal, which yep. means that they put that in the vagina and yep. you look at it with less tissue to obstruct your view. Yep. Mm-hmm. We usually like to have the transvaginal method because it gets us a lot closer to the tissues that we're looking at trying to evaluate, which gives us a lot better and more accurate measurement of um, all of the structures that we're wanting to know. So at what percentage of women have abnormal bleeding after menopause? Oh, I don't know if I'd have an exact percentage for you. 25 percent? So probably. it's really common. Yeah, it's very common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, on, and as a person gets older, does the risk of of uh, uterine cancer go up? Yes, absolutely. So when you see bleeding in a person who's not post just not just at menopause, but mm-hmm. let's say it's 10 years later, mm-hmm. that's that's a even more dangerous sign, right? Correct. And women should not ignore that sign. No. 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 And the treatment, if you catch it early, is hysterectomy. Yep. Mm-hmm. And easy. pretty easy, mm-hmm. yep. straightforward. Can be minimally invasive. Does small little incisions on the abdomen and. We're doing them now with uh, through the uter- through the vagina sometimes mm-hmm. without any scar. Yep. Exactly. So are we sometimes using probes and robots and right. things like mm-hmm. that? Yep. The robot I would say is is getting a little bit more common, especially for some of the cancer or some of the cases where there's concern for cancer. Okay. Yep. Wow. So. Very important information. Bladder incontinence is a medical dilemma that inconveniences about one third of all women at some point in their life. Female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery, or urogynecology, focuses around the support to a woman's pelvis. And there's a bowl of muscles that help support uh, the different organs that are related to the urologic tract, such as the bladder and urethra, the reproductive organs, such as the vagina and the uterus, and then as well as for defecation as it relates to the rectum and anus. And all these areas can be damaged during childbirth or they can develop problems later in life. And urogynecologists specialize not only in medical and muscle rehabilitation, but also the surgical management of these problems. And we've taken problems where we've had one surgery for a type of incontinence. Now we might have 10 different types of of procedures that we can individualize treatment to that that person. There's newer therapies such as uh, manipulating the nervous system to control the bowel and the bladder through stimulation of the nerves in the back. We're now using botulinum toxin injection to help relax the muscles to treat overactive bladder. Our surgeries have become minimally invasive, which used to be a two, three day stay in the hospital. They're leaving the hospital either that day or overnight. Uh, That has helped people recover faster, uh, driven down costs. And we have improved, improved our outcomes in terms of surgical management. And I think with specialized training now, people are getting better care and better, better outcomes. It could be the young mother that wants to get back to playing in her league volleyball team, 
Well, that is an easy fix where sometimes either muscle exercises or a simple surgical correction. Or it might be the uh, church elder who wants to get to uh, church and be more active still within the church and going to more meetings might just need a simple medication. And there's a whole gamut of things. And everyone, every treatment really has to be individualized to the person's. What are their expectations? What are their goals? What exactly is wrong? So diagnosing the problem becomes really the, the main focus. And then we can add treatments to where uh, they can benefit and what specifically helps the problem that we've come up with and diagnosed. If you want something new in women's health, urogynecology is what's new. The whole idea that we're treating the pelvic floor in women as one whole unit, what used to be, oh, I had to go see this doctor, I had to see this doctor, I had to see this therapist. There's someone that actually coordinates this area. And we're recognizing not only the difference women have with these types of uh, bowel and bladder issues, but the effects that birth and age have on this area in this region of the body. And now that there's someone who's devoted to this type of field, I mean, we're really kind of revolutionize our approach to people and more people are getting help because of this, which is really important because a lot of this has to relate to the aging aspect. And this is gonna be a huge issue as those baby boomers start moving into an older population and we're meeting the needs of it. So if you ask me if anything was new in the field of women's health, I would say definitely urogynecology or female pelvic medicine. Thank you, Dr. Barker. Join us on Facebook or Twitter to ask your questions. And there's good options there. So. So uh, Dr. Barker, this young Dr. Barker who has this beard now, I mean, it's very interesting. I think he needed that because he looks kind of like a young fella without it. You need to be more mature, you know, when you're a doc young doctor. What, what, uh, what did he say that you totally uh, uh, agreed with? Well, I think he's absolutely right. There are a lot of new techniques to help with urinary incontinence and prolapse issues. Um, and it used to be that women just had to live with these things. And now we have all of these new techniques that can help um, so that they can be more active. And I think that's important for quality of life. Right. You used to isolate a lot of people. Yeah. And kind of along those lines, I'd also totally agree with what he's talking about where you need to look at the patient as a whole. There's a lot of different causes that can lead to problems with incontinence. Um, getting to the idea of whether a patient needs to be treated, be treated or when they need to be treated um, depends a lot on how much this affects the patient's quality of life. So if this is something that's a minor inconvenience to them and they have ways of dealing with it that solves the problem for them, that may be a sufficient solution to the problem. If it's more than that, then I would say it's definitely something they need to look into do, doing further treatment. So definitely something that needs to be individualized to the patient. 10 and 20 years ago, the main treatment was we'd all give a pill that would dry up everybody's eyes and mouth and dry and, and prevent them uh, from having to go all the time when they had spasm. Mm -hmm. But the majority of problems with incontinence is not spasm, is it? Mm -hmm. And it, it doesn't work, really. We need to do these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a right echo, a comment? Yes. And there, is, there are some patients that having taking a medication does still help Potentially, potentially significantly with their problem, but there are also a decent number of patients that that is not going to be the Anyhow. correct solution to the problem that they have. Exactly. Now there's been some criticism that people have been going quickly to those procedures and these little support procedures and they're and, and maybe they're being overdone. I mean it, it's, a, it's a profitable thing for a hospital and, and it's maybe being pushed, I mean, and do you agree that with that? I mean, I, I, my sense is early on it was overdone. Well, and I think a lot um, maybe of what you're referring to is the mesh yeah. that was associated with a lot of the pelvic and vaginal repairs. Right. And that we've seen go by the wayside because we know that some of that vaginal mesh can um, cause more issues than it does good. Um, but there are other procedures, especially some of those procedures that Dr. Barker was referring to, that can help and don't involve mesh. So those are the newer procedures. Right. Um, and the risks are really low, kind of low? Minimal, yeah, minimal. I mean, it's surgery. There's so there's risk. always risks with surgery, but the risk is far, far lower than when using those, some of those vaginal meshes. Mm -hmm. Right. 
And there's even with what Dr. Hopper is saying, there's the difference between vaginal mesh and mesh that's used for some of these uh, bladder sling types of procedures. Um, and a lot of the bladder slings, um, that is the correct type of thing to be used to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the problems and a lot of the things that people will see on TV about um, lawsuits related to mesh is right. usually more related to the vaginal mesh types of things, which mm -hmm. is very correct. We're kind of getting away from those types of things. But there's a place for mesh in the bladder yeah. sling correct. kind of a thing. Not correct. all mesh is bad. Yes, not all mesh is bad. And so those, in general, the sling procedure, which is mm -hmm. probably the most common, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a good procedure to right. mm -hmm. and, and that's for a stress incontinence. Correct. Um, in, in an appropriately selected patient. Let's define mm -hmm. a stress incontinence versus uh, the other kinds. What? How do you define incontinence? So stress incontinence is typically a structural abnormality where we see hypermobility, we call it, or um, the urethra Over moves easily. And that's, that's usually just relaxation of the urethra. So when you cough or sneeze or lift something heavy, the urethra kind of drops down and allows urine to pass. Mm -hmm. um, these slings help to kind of put a support underneath the urethra so that when you do cough or sneeze, it can't drop. Drop. Mm -hmm. So it's over relaxed. I was I said yeah, wrong when right. I said that. So that's a stress incontinence. That's a stress incontinence. And what's, what you were talking about sounds more like what we would describe as urge incontinence. Right. So when you take your keys out of the car and you're getting ready to go home and all of a sudden you have the need to go to the bathroom and you need to go immediately. Um, a lot of those types of things that will be um, kind of an ingrained habit type of thing or you need to go frequently all the time um, or is more of like an urge type of incontinence. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Yeah, and that's usually from more of kind of a, um, the, the muscle that surrounds the bladder contracts too much or contracts too frequently, and which is a different problem than what we were talking right. about with the actual physical abnormality mm -hmm. with the stress urinary Making incontinence. the point that it it's important to make the right diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now the pill is helpful for that or is Correct. That, that can mm -hmm. that can be appropriately used to treat some of the um, urge incontinence types of things. Uh, and there's also mixed incontinence, which is kind of a combination both. of mm -hmm. both portions of things. Yeah. Uh, this question that uh, discuss bladder prolapse mm -hmm. that's more of this same thing you're talking about where yeah a so sling. that's a, that's a structural abnormality mm -hmm. um, where the the bladder tissue actually it's like a hernia that falls into the vaginal tissue and so then you can have even more of a mixed incontinence mm -hmm. picture a lot of those people have more of the urge incontinence um, and what's the 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 what happens is the bladder Get, and the tissue of the vagina gets so relaxed that part of the bl bladder wall, vaginal wall, pushes outside of the Correct. vagina. Mm -hmm. And you can fix that by hysterectomy, for one, right? Well, no. not really. Okay. Um, <laughs> so hysterectomy is more of an what we call an apical prolapse, so that's at the top of the vagina. Mm -hmm. um, and and that a hysterectomy or a, an apical suspension can help the apical support. So there's a lot of different support that we look at in the vagina. vagina. There's the anterior compartment, which is near the bladder, mm -hmm. the posterior compartment, which is With near the rectum. The rectum. And it can mm -hmm. do the rectum thing too. Yep, the rectum can push in and cause a hernia all as right. well. All right, this is the real question though. Why does this all happen? And if I were a 20 year old woman, what would I do to prevent this from happening? So there's a lot of different things that we can recommend that patients try to do to help prevent some of these. Um, Obesity is a big cause for all of these, so making, making sure that you're keeping your body weight at an appropriate BMI. Um, stopping smoking if you're a smoker because- Smoking uh, brings this on? Um, it has effects on the tissues that can subsequently lead to problems with prolapse. Okay. Um, parity or having had children is another risk factor for things. Increasing age, um, a lot of things that cause kind of repetitive um, use of some of the um, abdominal muscles like coughing, um, heavy lifting, some of those types of things can also predispose patients to having problems with prolapse. But if I exercise, uh, I'm better off. Try to stay thin, stay physically mm -hmm. fit, that's the key. I would say mm -hmm. avoid chronic constipation. That yep. can cause problems. Um, taking care of asthma, you yep. know, if you have a chronic cough, yep. can help prevent problems. And then the Kegel exercises. Okay, um. Kegel. <laughs> So let's talk about Kago. I've, I've written a number of essays on that because we've talked about this before. You've heard, heard mm -hmm. them. And that is tightening that muscle that tightens your sphincter around your rectum and your bladder, that whole thing, and holding it for five seconds and doing that 200 mm -hmm. times a day. Well, sure. <laughs> it's more of the pelvic floor muscles is what yeah. we call right. them. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yep. 
tell me about it. How effective is it? I've heard 50% effective if you actually do it. If you're doing it correctly, it can be very effective for things. Um, a lot of patients will, will have some difficulty trying to figure out exactly what muscles they need to be tightening or what muscles they need to be using to actually be doing these types of um, procedures effectively. But, so tell me, just run me through it really quickly. A Kegel exercise would be, and what, how would you say it to your patient? So usually what I would kind of describe it to a patient is if you're sitting down and you're using the restroom, you're going to want to use some of those muscles that you would normally use to kind of stop your stream of urine, to kind of um, help give a little bit of extra support, hold that for a few seconds, relax, and once you have kind of isolated some of those muscles, then kind of try to periodically tighten those throughout the day. Um, and if you're doing that repetitively over a course of time, that's going to help strengthen It's like those. lifting weights. Your muscles will get mm -hmm. stronger. and. Mm -hmm. thicker yep. and more effective. Yep. yep, and try to hold it for about 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. Oh, 10 um, seconds and... Yep, and then yeah. relax and repeat. And yep. Just do it whenever you can think about doing it. Exactly. I've heard 200 times a day. That's, that's a lot. That Otherwise, lot people don't do it. <laughs> so I've also read, uh, there's some data about, I know that they use magnetic resonance imaging kind of radiation, magnetics, for people who have depression that actually works in the brain. And there's some data, in Germany in particular, that's using MR beams for, to, act, to do the Kegel exercises side, sort of thing for oh. people. Have you heard that? I guess I, I have not heard of that. It's not, well. So going hand in hand with prevention is early detection of cancers. Regular tests for some cancers can be a life-saving habit. During the cervical cancer screening, a uh, provider inserts an instrument called the speculum into the vaginal opening and uses a few um, small instruments to collect samples from the cervix um, to send to the lab to be seen. So this is the vaginal opening where the provider would insert the speculum. Here is the cervix where the provider would take a few samples. The cervix is similar to the lining of the inside of your mouth. So imagine like a popsicle stick on the inside of your mouth. When the sample is sent to the lab, they look at the cells underneath a microscope and determine abnormality. When results come back abnormal, typically um, depends on what level of abnormality the results are read at. Um, they may just have to come back for another rescreen, um, or they may have to be seen for a procedure called a colposcopy, which is um, similar to like a biopsy of the cervix. Um, the cervical cancer screening should start at age 21 and be done every three years. Um, as long as they stay normal, um, the results stay normal. Um, screenings can be done every three years. If they come back abnormal, um, providers would give recommendations on how often they should be done after that. Um, depending on what level of abnormality they come back, typically it's pretty common that patients will come back every six months to be rechecked. People with cervical cancer may experience increased abdominal size, indigestion, bloating, or gas, nausea, difficulty eating or feeling full quickly, unexplained weight gain or loss, um, changes in bowel or bladder, um, back discomfort, pelvic or abdominal pain, and unusual fatigue. It's important to receive good health care and to ensure that you're at your healthy best. So going in for your annual screenings to see your physician yearly is an important thing to do and talk about the cervical cancer screening. If you have any questions about anything women's health, call us at 1-888-376-6225 or email us at oncalltv.org and push the ask button. Find us on Facebook, just search Prairie Doc or at the Prairie Doc on, 20, at, uh, uh, on Twitter. So, Twitter. I've not even <laughs> entered Twitter yet. Sorry. So, that was interesting, cervical cancer. When should a woman have a pap smear? How soon? What's the beginning? How often? And when can they quit it? So we now recommend that women start having pap smears at age 21. Not two Doesn't, years after sexual activity? Regardless of sexual activity. We, 21. 21. 21 is the start. Um, and then between the ages of 21 and 30, every three years, um, as long as their paps have always been normal, after age 30, we can do something called co-testing, where we do the pap, and on the same sample, we look at the cells under the microscope, which is the standard pap, right. and also check for the HPV or human papillomavirus. Now, that's a 
that's the, the standard wart, but there's some warts that are, there are a lot of different kinds of warts, aren't there? Correct. So there are lots of different strains of that HPV virus. There's strains that cause warts on your hands. Right. Um, there are strains that cause genital warts. And there are also strains that cause um, precancerous or cancer on the cervix, precancerous right. lesions or cancer on and the cervix. And that's why we do pap smears. I mean, that's Correct. It. Exactly. Yeah. So you so, recommend that So between ages, or after age 30, you can do that co-testing where we check both of those, the cells and the HPV virus, and then you can space out to every five years as long as both of those are negative. So every five years, mm -hmm. if the virus test at 30 is, is negative. negative. Correct. Wow, that's a huge change. It's a big change, and then yes. when And then after, uh, there's a certain age that you quit. Usually between the ages of 65 and 70, as long as you've always had normal PAPs. You know, right. those recommendations change, of course, if you've had abnormal PAPs. But if you've always had normal PAPs, that's the new standard guidelines. So that's the, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We still recommend that you have annual exams. Yes. Right. That's and the big let's thing. Let's talk so about people, it. The yep. pelvic exam, the breast exam, Larissa, I mean, mm -hmm. we're not saying don't come in and have a pelvic no. exam and a no. breast exam. Not by any means. We should start that at age 21. I would even say some portion of that can be started earlier, um, especially if a patient has been sexually active, because there are still other things that we can screen, screen for, looking for any sort of sexually transmitted infections, some of those types of things, and just get, kind of getting in the habit of starting to do the pelvic exam, being familiar with what we do, how we do the exam, doing a breast exam, some of those types of things. I would still say patients should, should do that uh -huh. every every year until they're I would say they should just continue that. <laughs> just come in and see their doctor mm -hmm. every year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there are some reasons where you wouldn't ever need a pelvic exam again and that's if you've had a hysterectomy and your ovaries removed, so uterus and ovaries removed. You um, don't need a pelvic for exam a, anymore. For a benign, a benign reason. Mm -hmm. Now, it so, used to be OBGYN doctors still did pap smears every year on even when the uterus was yep. gone. And if the, if the uterus is removed for a benign reason, so a, not a cancerous thing, then you don't need to do paps anymore. But if there's a cancer? If there's a cancer, then we do follow with paps mm -hmm. for, for usually period. about five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So even though the cervix isn't there, we'll stu still do a pap of what we call the vaginal cuff. So kind of w by where the um, top of the vagina is, we'll still do a, do pap, a pap smear, smear of that to make sure there's no abnormal cells there. Now, a pap smear, what is that? So it's, it's kind of a collection of some of the kind of superficial cells that are on the surface of the cervix. Um, and then we send that to pathology lab and they take a look at it under the microscope. You and kind of scrape gently with a, a swabbing brush. Now. Yeah, we usually use more of kind of a brush type of device that collects some of the cells both on the surface of the cervix itself and just very superficially into the endometrial canal. Yeah. And then we'll send that to pathology, have them take a look at that, and they're able to tell us if there's any sort of abnormalities in the cells themselves. And if there are, then we usually will kind of make recommendations depending on what that level of abnormality is for further follow-up, whether that be something like a colposcopy. Um, colposcopy, mm -hmm. which is? So that's kind of where we take a little bit more of a specialized look at the cervix. We almost kind of look, look at it a little bit under a microscope. Yeah, it's a sort of a microscope you put mm -hmm. up into the vagina and look really close mm -hmm. at the uterus and you swab it with special stains and stuff. Well, yeah, we kind of use a little bit of, yep, yep, it's almost a vinegar type of solution that helps us identify which areas of the surface of the cervix are abnormal and maybe triggering that abnormality on the pap smear. And then we'll usually take biopsies or just very small tissue samples of that area so that we can kind of correlate in the tissue what that level of abnormality is and give us a little bit more information for how closely um, or what type of follow-up we need to do for that. As long as we're talking about screening and so on and so forth, let's, let's take on the issue of breast cancer screening. Mm -hmm. When, what about, you know, I've heard recently they've criticized the self-breast exam, mm -hmm. that it hasn't been effective. Right. I, I think that's hoo-ha, personally, because uh, the breast cancers that I've diagnosed, half of them, I bet you, were mm -hmm. right. brought in by the patient saying, I got a lump here I mm -hmm. found when I was mm -hmm. taking a shower and I mm -hmm. felt it, and mm -hmm. what do you think? So we now recommend what we call breast self-awareness. So it's knowing what feels normal to you, mm -hmm. which of course involves a self-breast exam. Right. But you don't necessarily have to do them every single month because what the studies have found is that we were probably doing too many unnecessary okay. procedures. Women's breasts change throughout their cycle every month, yeah. um, and you can develop cysts and things like that that aren't always worrisome. Bumps that come and go mm -hmm. with your cycle exactly. are yeah. really routine and not dangerous. Right, yeah. but we do still recommend that women know what is normal for them.
Yeah. So that they can know what's abnormal. Okay. Yeah. And things that we usually kind of run, recommend looking for are anything that seems like it's new, different, anything that's changing in size, um, anything that seems like it's fixed or not mobile, because a lot of times people will have lumps and bumps in the breast tissue. But that itself is not necessarily but it's movable, abnormal. Movable. Yep. And most but if of the it's time, fixed, exactly. Most problem. of the time, when you push on them, they'll kind of move around, yep. and that's pretty normal. If you push on the lump and it, so it doesn't seem like it wants to move around. That's Not a bad a idea to have that checked out. Red flag. Or anything that seems like it changes the color or the texture of the breast. Mm -hmm. Right. And how many of these are cystic? I mean, they're just normal, benign cysts in the breast. You see that a lot. We do see that a lot. Put I would a say needle in it, take it out, send that in. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay, so how about the mammography? I mean, it, yeah, I know that there's some disagreement with the American College of Physicians and the American College of Gynecology, OBGYN. Mm -hmm. Some disagreement yeah. about how often it should be. Mm -hmm. and, and the National uh, Association of Screening da 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 says start at 50 mm -hmm. and the GYN doctors have recommended 40. Correct. So what, what do you guys think? I go with ACOG, so I still recommend that patients... ACOG, the American College of yep. Gynecology. Yep, which is kind of our governing body for who makes our recommendations for obstetrics and gynecology. As opposed to my governing body, the American <laughs> College of Physicians. But go ahead. Yes. You go with ACOG. But, but so, now, what yes. is that? What do they say? I usually still recommend to patients that they start with a baseline screening mammogram at age 40 and then have yearly mammograms thereafter. So a screening beginning at 40 and every year. Correct. Yeah. And between the ages of 40 and 50, every other year, would, would be, be okay, okay too, mm -hmm. but definitely after age 50 every year. Yeah. But isn't it because when women are 40 to 50, they have more fibrous tissue, there's gonna be mm -hmm. false positives, and, they, and their risk of cancer is less. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so you reach a point of, well, it comes in, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so it's kind of a push. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to know. If there's a lot of cancer in your family, then you may oh, want absolutely. to. What, what about the gene thing? Uh, the BRCA gene and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Explain that a little bit. I should be answering, have you answering questions, but I've got these yeah, questions so I need here. Yeah, so just briefly, the BRCA gene mutations are um, a, a set of abnormalities in our genes or in right. people's genes that can put you at increased risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, other cancers like pancreatic cancer, melanomas. And if a family has a, um, a, a strong family history of early cancers, or anybody that has ovarian cancers, I mean, those gene mutations can play a role. And then the, the screening recommendations change. So then we would start doing even, you know, breast MRI and mammograms, you know, every six months in patients who we know have those abnormalities. You ever just remove the breasts? Yes. So they are at really significant high mm -hmm. risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's recommended that they then have their ovaries removed as well yeah. after childbearing. Yeah. But these are really pretty rare, aren't they? I mean, even if there's a breast cancer in your family, many times it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. the, that, that. If yeah. you don't have that gene, it doesn't mean you're protected. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's families that have multiple family yeah. members typically that have those associated cancers or young family members, so under age 50 um, is what we consider young for those so gene to, mutations. To get the gene. So mm -hmm. you should get it um, if you have that in a, mm -hmm. in a family member that had that kind of cancer under 50, ovarian mm -hmm. cancer, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, uh, anything else that we want to take home on? It's very expensive. Insurance doesn't always cover it unless it's absolutely indicated. Is that right? Um, some portion of things is going to de depend a little bit on what your family history is. And sometimes if you have a family member who has already been diagnosed with that, you can use some of that information that they have obtained from their study to be able to kind of nar narrow down what your focus is and look for that particular gene th that had been the original mutation to see if you have that gene. And so in some of those cases, you have a little bit better coverage for things or can do the test at a decreased cost. So you got to be careful. Stand, they they may population. balk on us, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they yeah. may say, I'm sorry, I won't cover it. And yeah. it's several thousands oh, of dollars. Yeah. A small change in one's lifestyle magnified daily over months and years can do wonders in maintaining the quality of life as you age. For women, menopause is a reality check that your body is changing. This is a time to take care of yourself by making healthy lifestyle changes. Eating well and being physically active will make this midlife transition easier. Due to lowering hormone levels and the natural aging process, many women find it harder to keep extra pounds off in their 40s and 50s. 
Often women lose muscle and gain fat, mainly in the belly area. Lifestyle factors come into play too. Menopausal women tend to be less active and eat more calories than they need. Weight gain during this time is linked to possible health issues, including high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and insulin resistance. Plan ahead for your body's natural metabolic slowdown. As with any time in life, there are not quick fixes when it comes to weight loss. There are, however, ways to avoid a midlife crisis when it comes to a slowing metabolism. Be physically active. Adults should do at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise most days of the week. Exercise does not always have to mean a trip to the gym. Find ways to be active in your daily activity, such as taking the stairs, gardening, or even walking with friends. Eat right. Foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and lean protein foods contain the nutrients you need without too many calories. Try to use smaller dishes at your meals to ensure smaller portions. Cook more often at home to help you control what is in your food. And when eating out, choose the lower calorie menu or share a meal with someone else. Thank you, Katie. She talked lifestyle. I mean, lifestyle is it, though. I mean, in healthcare, uh, we, we're dependent on pills. We depend on surgery, probably too much on pills. How much should we be putting our attention to encouraging people to be physically active and eat properly? I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's absolutely important. I mean, that's the basis of everything in health um, is exercise and healthy eating habits. Right. I've got a question. So many different things. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, what are the benefits of water aerobics for an 80-year-old woman? I mean, there it is. I love that question. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a great benefit. I was going to say that's it's a great method of exercise. It's it's a low impact type of thing, so it doesn't have some of the increased stress on the the bones and joints, those types of things. Gets you out. Gets you active. Um, gets your um, heart pumping and your blood flowing. And I think it's a great great option for exercise. The only problem uh, has to do with the fact that you don't generally do it every day. And I like an everyday thing. So I would say mm -hmm. walk, walk in between that. Mm -hmm. So here's a question about calcium and osteoporosis. So how important is, what can we do to enhance the strength of bones? So calcium and vitamin D supplements, of course, can help with um, bone health. Weight-bearing activity. So walking, weightlifting, um, help help to increase your bone mass. Mm -hmm. um, Any comments about doing bone density testing? What's your take on that, Larissa? Um, so there's there are pluses and minuses to things. Um, standardly, they kind of recommend starting that at about age 65 and not repeating any more frequently than every three years. Um, recently, they have kind of come up with a, a FRAX index that kind of goes along with some of the DEXA testing to help guide people for whether or not they need to have any sort of um, additional medication supplementation. Um, and I actually have had quite a few people that have had a DEXA, but their FRAX index was not significant enough that we would normally recommend treatment with any medications for those. I think the people who set up the initial indicators for, oh, then you need to start a pill, mm -hmm. were the people who who the index was set up by the people who were selling the pill. I mean, all of a sudden we're doing all these DEXAs. So it's not to say that osteoporosis is not a real deal. Correct. But I think we've overemphasized the medication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and there is good medicine. There's different kinds. Mm -hmm. But it really needs to be clearly indicated. Mm -hmm. Yep, there are there are good medications for it, but like any medication, um, it can have its own set of risks and benefits um, and possible side effects that can go along with it. Make so. absolutely sure you've had your vitamin D tested if there's a question of, uh, of osteoporosis. Make sure that you're not missing that one. And what is the most important treatment of osteoporosis but pre you know, stress on your bones with mm -hmm. a regular exercise mm -hmm. program? Yep. So don't wait till you're 65 and go, oh, I should be, should have been exercising all my life. Get to go walking every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You Especially agree with Especially in younger adults yes. because that's when your most formative time is for your bone health. Mm -hmm. Inter interstitial cystitis, what's that? You want to take this one? Um, so it's a disease of the bladder. Um, and it's, it's 
often a diagnosis of exclusion because it is it can be very difficult to diagnose. Um, a lot of times people prevent, present with pelvic pain and so of course there's lots of things in the pelvis. There's the bowel, there's the bladder, there's the uterus, the ovaries. And so we're looking at all those different things um, to help us decide, you know, what is going on. Um, diagnosing interstitial cystitis usually involves looking in the bladder with a camera and um, patients tend to have ulcers in the bladder. Um, it's, a, it's a complex disease, but there is a newer medicine that's available to help with interstitial cystitis. There are also lifestyle um, things that you can do, so dietary things and restricting certain acidic foods, um, caffeine. caffeine, that sort of thing that can help with interstitial it's cystitis. It's sort of like irritable bowel though, isn't yeah. it? It's like it's, it's irritable like... bladder and mm -hmm. it's made worse by being worried about it. I would say it's not uncommon for patients to come in with complaints of feeling like they need to go to the bathroom all the time. It's symptoms that you would normally associate with a urinary tract infection, mm -hmm. but when you check the urine, there's nothing wrong with the urine. Mm -hmm. Like feeling like they need to go to the bathroom all the time, but when they get when they get there and try to go to the bathroom, they're only able to void small amounts each yeah. time. And this is not something that's happening for a month and then it stops. It's something that's present for quite it a long period of time. Right. And mm -hmm. I saw your reaction when the question came up because you know what? It's one of the hardest things to treat. Mm -hmm. and it's a Diagnosis of exclusion is sort of the bane of your life, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's a tough, tough issue. Diagnosis of exclusion means you have to rule out every other thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's a question. Uh, vaginal dryness. She's on uh, blood thinners for deep venous thrombosis. How can she deal with dryness? Vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. That's another story. We see a lot of that as a mm -hmm. age. Uh, how, uh, what do you do? How do you do? Uh, what do you do for them? So if you have a patient that is, that is mainly experiencing some of these types of things with intercourse, I would say one of the easiest solutions is to get, is going to be to use like some sort of water-based lubricant, um, like a uh, Astroglide. I don't know if I can give the name on, on air. Oh, no, you can't. But, right. um, but I one would say one brand is Astroglide. You yeah. can find it on the internet, or you can find you it. You can actually find it in most of the just um, Walmart, Kmart, Shopko, KY. Target. Um, KY is a good one, but I would say I have a lot of patients that have found that that can sometimes be a little bit more drying to the tissues because it does have a little bit higher alcohol content yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. So, Astroglide. Mm -hmm. I would maybe one. recommend more of a water-based lubricant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lubrication for sexual activity. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. But there's vaginal dryness. There's also mouth dryness and eye dryness that happens mm -hmm. as people get older. And some mm -hmm. people just have are drier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I recommend to them is ground flaxseed. It makes, the, it sort of brings an oil back into their system mm -hmm. and it makes their coat shiny too, I always say. <laughs> you know, I think the other thing with that question is we do have to weigh the risks and benefits. So when you have an atrophic vaginitis related to atrophic dryness meaning. of menopause. Irritated kind of, mm -hmm. vagina from dryness. It really affects your quality of life. Um, and some breast cancer patients have that too, you know, and we always worry about estrogen in people who've had right. blood clots and people who've had breast yeah. cancer. You do have to weigh those risks and benefits. I've t I've, I had a patient who had a hysterectomy with her ovaries removed that had breast cancer. You know, was always told she couldn't be on a localized estrogen in the vagina, but was miserable and young, and it really affected her quality of life. I visited with her oncologist, and he said, you know what, give her some vaginal estrogen. Yeah. It's twice a week, it's a very low dose. Yes, there is a risk. But, but but the risks are really low. They and, I are. mean, didn't we get overwhelmed by the risks? I mean, what is the risk of you know everybody had estrogen what, f first fifteen years of my practice, and then suddenly it was the bad actor. I mean, you, oh my gosh, you brought on all this cancer. Mm -hmm. But isn't it something like in, per ten thousand it raises the risk of of uh, vad uh, of uterine cancer from fifteen to twenty three out of ten thousand something mm -hmm. like that. I mean, am I right on that? Mm -hmm. It's, yes. It's minimal it, it, got a, it got a very bad rap yes. in one particular study. Um, and, and so we're, we're back to using the lowest effective dose for the shortest amount of time. And it's so, okay to use if you really need it. Sometimes an oral estrogen, sometimes a vaginal estrogen would be safer. And I was going to say there's, there's differences in the types of administration and the risks that go along with that. So what Dr. Hopper was talking about was a vaginal estrogen, which is more of a local administration of something. So while it has a risk for blood clot, it's going to be less than what it would be if you're administering it's system-wide with like an estrogen tablet by mouth. Is there a mm -hmm. type of vaginal estrogen you use? I mean, diethylstilbestrol or, or uh, no, no, not that anymore. 
Sorry. It's just estradiol. <laughs> just estradiol, mm -hmm. that's so it. So that Vagifem is a brand that I use. It's a 10 microgram pill, so but just a tiny, a tiny generic? dose. Vagifem is the kind. Yeah, estradiol, est estradiol is okay. the generic estradiol. name. Generic. Mm -hmm. All right. How to fix a prolapsed uterus? Is it surgery? Do you always do surgery for prolapsed uterus? Or are there devices you can put up there? There are other options that are not necessarily surgical. Um, there's some of the things that we had talked about with Kegels, strengthening Kegel uh, pelvic exercise. floor muscles. Yep. Um, there's also options for um, kind of symptomatic treatment of particular portions of things with the prolapse that are bothering you. Um, in addition to that, there's options for things like pessaries, um, which is Pessary. kind of a device. Mm -hmm, it's kind of a device that we um, are able to place in the vaginal vault, and depending on what the shape of the pessary is, um, can kind of help support the uterus or help support whatever portion of the anatomy is causing that prolapse. And so that's always a first line option that we can give patients to try, especially if they're not wanting to jump right to surgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, why uh, is in insomnia common in women? That's a good oh, question. Man. It's a broad question. Insomnia is, is common though in all people, mm -hmm. I mean both sexes. Mm -hmm. Maybe more common in women? Uh, maybe around the time of menopause. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be an associated symptom when your hormones are yeah. changing. Um, you know, along with hot flashes, the vaginal yeah. dryness, the mood changes. Yeah. There are all sorts of things that women experience around menopause. Um, I think sometimes anxiety can go along with mm -hmm. insomnia as well. You know, you can't shut your mind off and fall asleep. And Let's, um, We've got just a little bit of time. Let's say a few things about menopause. What, what would you say? I mean, there's some people who have tremendous trouble with the, the hot flashes and so on and so forth. And one particular doctor has recommended gabapentin that night. I've heard all sorts of different options, you know, the SSRIs that are used for depression, but they can help with menopause. What, what's your take home for that? Very quickly now. So there are a couple different options. So we, we, we can always look at doing hormonal supplementation with hormone replacement medications. Um, gabapentin is one of the um, non-hormonal options that we can offer to patients. Um, some of the SSRIs, like you had mentioned, are another option, which is kind of a um, medication that can have a number of different uses. And then there's also another medication called clonidine that can be offered to patients for a non-hormonal treatment for it, some of the menopausal it's symptoms. It's an old anti-hypertensive mm -hmm. drug, clonidine. Why would it yep. work? Um, I'm not sure if they really know the true answer to that. It's not at a dosage that is used to treat blood pressure types of problems. So it's a different dosage and it seems to trigger different that? responses in patients. Yeah. Yep. And so your best suggestion, most common treatment for menopausal symptoms would be? If it's hot flashes, it's usually hormonal, mm -hmm. so estrogen replacement. Yep. If it's other symptoms, mood changes, insomnia, that would typically be an SSRI. Mm -hmm. So the antidepressants mm -hmm. that we know have been studied in menopause, Effexor is one that tends to work very well. Right, so and they've recently so. come out with a couple other um, slightly different versions for dosages that are options as well. Very good. We'll be right back after this. Ready to quit? Great, we're ready to help. Call the quit line to set up a quit date. Takes about 15 minutes. Next time we talk, we'll review free medications, triggers, coping, withdrawal. Takes about 30 minutes. Check in for two more support calls and we'll go over challenges, how to handle slips. And don't worry, if you're stressed or things get rough, just call. Then bam, you're tobacco free. So take a deep breath, you can do this. Is equality between the sexes good for men and women and society? Of course, men and women are different in many important ways, yet some people exploit the differences to make subservient generalizations about women. I've heard it said that women are, or should be, shy and passive, want to please, adoring, doting, and happy as homemakers serving their children and husbands. Sigmund, Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst, said, nature has determined women's destiny through beauty and charm and sweetness, in youth an adored darling, and in mature years a loved wife. Freud even went so far as to suggest that women who wanted careers were neurotic and imbued with penis envy. As Betty Friedan observed in 1963, Freud's ideas had become especially popular in the mid-40s, 
suggesting women are only fulfilled as housewives and mothers and unhappy having a career. She decries Freud's error in judgment in her book, The Feminine Mystique. Ferdan noted that in the early 1900s, there had been grand advances made for the rights of women, especially for higher education, for the pursuit of career, and for the right to vote. Well, except for the right to vote, much of this went away after World War II when men came home from the war and took away jobs from women who had be, been employed to support the war. The returning soldier longed for a comfortable home where he was the breadwinner and his wife the housekeeper who raised the children. For Dan said this caused great unhappiness in many households when women who wanted a career were strongly discouraged to do so. Injustice and inequality beget disharmony. Well, since then, due to the effort of Fredan and many others, women have choices and are coming close to equality in career work. Currently, new physician graduates are about 50-50 women to men. Studies show satisfying careers and or choices for all the adult members of a family, all the members, results in happier children. Outside the home careers are not for everyone, but the operative word here is choice. Equality begets family and societal harmony. Take it one step further. Experts state that empowering and educating women in developing countries or where there's great poverty allows for the most effective way to bring the region in the direction of prosperity. Empowered and educated young women, better yet mothers and fathers, raise girls and boys to become more effective and respectful members of society. Equality between men and women does not subtract from the success of men. It increases the success for everyone. When women and men are equals, society becomes healthy. This brings us to the end of our show this evening. For more of this discussion and answers for some of the questions we didn't answer during the show, join us for After Hours on our website, oncalltv.org. I sincerely thank our wonderful guests tonight, Dr. Ellen Hopper and Dr. Larissa Bennis. Flu season will be with us for some time yet, so there is still a sound reason to get a flu shot if you haven't already. Go get one. It was the singer and actress Cher who exposed the truth that women are the real architects of society. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Most of this we learned from our own experience growing up in our families, how our parents, grandparents, other family members, or friends lived their lives. Not everyone had that advantage, though. The base of our society, family care. Next time, on call with The Prairie Doc. After Hours, where we answer the questions we did, weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All of your questions are important to us, and we want to answer as many as we can for you. So let's just dive right in. From Sioux Falls, four years ago, endometrial cancer had hysterectomy with ovaries removed. Do I still need to get pap smears? For one more year. So usually we follow with, with paps of the vaginal cuff, kind of like we talked about, okay. for five years after a, a cancer has been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. So if it was a cancer, then you would do every year for five more years or one more well, year? you actually do them usually every 
three months for the first two years, and then mm -hmm. after that, every year for three more years to make yep. it five. So see your GYN oncologist exactly. or whoever did your hysterectomy for one more pap, okay. if it was four years ago. If it was four years ago. Yeah. That's it. Right. So yep. four more. Uh, Watertown, 76-year-old person, uh, uh, four foot ten. And she said, uh, caller had a fistula between the bladder and the bowel. Mm -hmm. What is that and what do you do for it? So a fistula is kind of an abnormal connection from one area to another. So in this case, Pipe. it happened to be, yeah, in this case, it happened to be between the bladder and the bowel. Um, so can be caused by a number of different things, but in the end, it still needs to be fixed or resolved. Or um, otherwise, you keep getting fecal material in the bladder correct. and such recurrent infection. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that sets you That's up for a, a whole thing. host of problems. Okay. So um, for that type of thing, I would probably recommend having them seen by, I would probably say a urogynecologist because that's going to be the type of person that's general. going to be, yep. A general, general surgeon, surgeon. Mm -hmm. or a colorectal, colorectal. surgeon. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. But you need to close that pipe off. Exactly. But the, the question is why do they occur though? What's the most common reason? Well, it can be bowel related, so Crohn's disease, mm -hmm. ulcerative colitis, it can be previous surgeries, yep. so just scar tissue from a previous surgery. Um, we see mesh mm -hmm. that mesh has in the past the that mesh. has caused... Mm -hmm. The um, sling procedure mm -hmm. doesn't do that much though. Mm -hmm. no. no. Things that cause inflammation and kind of cause continued irritation of that area. And then they, a pipe, a tube between the, mm -hmm. colo, the colon and the bladder can occur mm -hmm. and then your bladder is always infected. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, please discuss Premarin, when to take or not. Is it necessary to have a pap smear after hysterectomy with one or no ovaries and why? So we did talk about Premarin. Mm -hmm. yep. Bottom line on Premarin, it's not always a bad thing. There's a risk to it, but... Correct. Yep. Yep. It's kind of one of those things that needs to be individualized to the patient. Mm -hmm. Right. And necessary to have a pap smear after hysterectomy uh, uh, with one or no ovaries. If there was no cancer, no. No mm -hmm. cancer, no. Regardless of what's going on with the ovaries. Right. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with the yep. ovaries. Exactly. Had a hysterectomy due to a misfiring endocrine gland of the uterus. Why does this happen? What is a misfiring of the endocrine gland? Had a hysterectomy because the uterus was in span. Oh, misfire, probably bleeding. Could be. Could be bleeding, could be like, some people get this pelvic congestion syndrome where they have increased congestion of the vasculature and nerves in the pelvis. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not exactly sure, you what know, that? what this person um, means by the misfiring, but. Um, what about fibroids? Fibroids of the, that we call, in Atlanta, and I'm not making fun, this, this, they used to call them fibro, fireballs of the uterus. I can remember <laughs> actually hearing a lady say, I had fireballs. Mm -hmm. But what are fibroids, and do you need to do a hysterectomy for that? So fibroids are usually just a, a enlarging or an abnormal collection of some of the smooth muscle tissue. But not cancer. Not cancer, although there's a, I would say, a minimal risk for the potential of it. Um, but in the average patient who has had fibroids that have stayed the same size for years, I would say very Maybe. minimal risk. Mm -hmm. As long as they're not causing them symptoms, they don't yeah. need to do anything with Sometimes them. they about, get big enough they can cause them. Right. Mm -hmm. And about 70% of women actually have fibroids, mm -hmm. so they're very, very common. Yep. It's just like Dr. Bennett said, if they cause symptoms, if you're having heavy bleeding, mm -hmm. pelvic pain, pressure type symptoms, because they can get very large, mm -hmm. then that's a reason to have them removed. Otherwise. You can control heavy bleeding with medical options yep. too. Right. So, yep. number of other, other things. And they tend to shrink when you go through menopause. They don't always go away, but they don't. They aren't a problem anymore yep. usually. Britain, 50-year-old, regarding mammograms, she's been advised to get an uh, an uh, expensive ultrasound test, but can't afford it. And was wondering how important it is. I would say some of that is kind of going to be dependent upon what the reason was for the recommendation for the ultrasound. Um, if it's a situation where they're wanting to e evaluate some sort of abnormality on a mammogram further, then I would say it's, it's a good test to have done because it can help either rule in or rule out an abnormality. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in, in young women who have symptoms, so breast pain or they feel something, we do recommend an ultrasound because it can give us more information on does this look cystic, mm -hmm. so fluid filled, or does it look cancerous? Okay. Um, and that's where the ultrasound can help determine that. A vermilion wondering if the docs could discuss um, tessin, tessery, uh, it pessary, must be a pessary, pessary. pessary. Uh, as an alternative surgery for vaginal prolapse, your doctors seem to be 
pushing surgery. What about a pessary? And we had we kind did of talked about that, that a little bit. Yep. Um, there are a number of different shapes and sizes of pessaries. Um, what would be a shape? Would it be a ring that you would just push into the mm -hmm. vagina? It would hold things up there or what? There are ones that are just shaped like a ring. There are ones that are um, ring shaped and have what we call kind of a support mechanism in between. So in between the actual ring, there's a little bit of material. There are ones that are shaped more like a donut. There are ones that are shaped like a cube. Um, there, hmm. are, there are gellhorn pessaries that are almost kind of like a little flat disc with a little bit of a, almost like a handle on the end. Um, there's a lot of different shapes. And pessaries aren't just for prolapse. We have pessaries actually for the stress incontinence that we talked about on the show where the, the urethra, that tube that empties the bladder, moves easily. There are pessaries actually that have um, extra support that you place right under the urethra inside the vagina to help avoid surgery for the stress incontinence yeah. too. Wow. So. Sometimes for patients that just have problems when they're exercising when they're, or when they're doing a certain activity, they can use something like a pessary Put to... Put the pessary in before mm -hmm. they yep. exercise. Yep, and then take it and, out when they're done. Yep, and many, many women do very well with pessaries. Um, there are a lot of more active, you know, younger women who prefer a surgical route because with a pessary, you do have to put it in and take it out. Mm -hmm. You leave it in too long and sometimes you can get um, infections. infections or you can get ulcers um, in the vagina. So that's the other thing to think about with, with pessaries. Yep. Please discuss Botox procedure to treat incontinence, why, when, how. Uh, and this is in a 62-year-old uh, person whose mother, 90-year-old mother, is considering this procedure. Okay. This is that's it. Yeah, great question for that's Dr. Barker. <laughs> but the way Botox works is it... Um, basically acts as a, I mean, it's a, it's a, relaxer, it's a relaxer, relaxer, right, right. I don't want to say toxin, but <laughs> it's a relaxer of the muscle. And so if you have an overactive bladder, I think what Dr. Barker was um, alluding to is that you can use this to help relax that muscle um, so that you don't have to use the oral medications that maybe cause really dry, side effects. Dryness and, mouth and dryness, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it's kind of spendy though. But yeah, if it works, it, right, it's mm -hmm, right. a great deal. Yep. yep. Uh, caller has low bladder tone. Has been, uh, she has to push in on her abdomen to urinate. If she tries to hold the urine, she is incontinent. What can she do? So for some, I would say this type of patient, if she's aware that she has um, kind of an abnormal bladder tone, doing something like timed voiding. So if she's aware that she can hold her urine for a certain amount of time without having problems, um, then I would say if that happens to be, she can go for two and a half hours, then maybe at two hours, she should try to make a stop in the restroom just to avoid having accidents for those types of things. Good answer. Polycystic ovarian syndrome was wondering if she, if the doc could discuss this, her daughter has it and she's, she's developed a beard. Okay, let's talk about polycystic ovary. So it's very common, yes. polycystic ovarian syndrome. Like it's a one in. Oh, oh. I would 100. say it's. I would say it's more common than that. 15, 20 percent. You think it's? Whoa. And it and it goes along oftentimes with obesity. So, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's a metabolic syndrome. It can be familial. Mm -hmm. So that you're at increased risk for developing diabetes, mm -hmm. high cholesterol. Yeah. Um, and usually you have um, signs of what we call hyperandrogenism, so higher levels of the male hormones that we ought, as women all make, mm -hmm. but those levels are higher and so you can develop dark coarse hair that grows on your chin or chest. Um, you can develop more acne. Um, some people have thinning of the hair associated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. You get mean and aggressive. <laughs> Just a joke. Just a joke. I'm, I'm going to stay kidding. out of that one. <laughs> you can have irregular cycles, so irregular periods with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and, and truly, not everybody who has polycystic ovarian syndrome is overweight, but the majority are. Um, there are what we call thin or non-classical polycystic ovarian syndrome patients, too. Um, and you can, can treat it by, with metformin, I mean a diabetic pill. No. <laughs> for insulin sens in for insulin insensitivity yes. or glucose intolerance. Yep. Yes, we can use metformin. But that um, makes them fertile. Correct. It can help with their cycles. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there, there's a whole Story lot there. of avenues with PCOS. Yeah. We could um, spend another hour yep. on that. Yep, <laughs> depends <laughs> on the sure. age of the patient and what their goals are. Do they want pregnancy? Do they not want pregnancy? So birth control pills oftentimes are what that. we use as a first line. That's usually so, what my primary recommendation is for mm -hmm. patients as well. They, um, they actually increase the binding of your free male hormones and so that can help with the hair growth, the acne, those sorts of things and of course regulate your cycles which is important too. Okay. But as far as the actual hair growth portion of things there's not any medication that we can give patients that makes things go backwards in time so you can't give a medication that's going to magically make the hair go away. Um, we usually say the only permanent hair removal solution is going to be actual physical removal of the hair. Um, those types of things. They, they, there are some ways where people can mm -hmm. take out mm -hmm. the yeah. hair, so hair follicles. Right, mm -hmm. and there are medicines that can help to sort of decrease that hair yep. growth. There's laser treatments yep. now that help to get rid of the hair growth. I mean, there's all sorts of things that... Okay. But what our goal and treatment would be for trying to take care of the PCOS would be to try to prevent the further progression of some of those types of things. Okay. Any take-home final messages that you'd like to make? I would just say make sure that you come in to have your annual well woman exams. There's a lot of, lot of different things that can go on in the lifestyle of women and make sure that we're evaluating and getting a chance to treat all of those that we need to. Okay. I concur. Okay. <laughs> and I would say if you're pregnant or possibly pregnant, that's in particular, we need to make mm -hmm. sure that you're seeing somebody for your health care. make sure mm -hmm. that works out so your baby is fine. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Baby and mom both. Well, thank you both for, for doing this. It's, it's, it's hard to put a person on the line and face those darn cameras, but we appreciate you so much. Thank you, and thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. <laughs>